Hey everyone, Gary here with Tennessee Stands and excited today to introduce someone new to you. Uh, we, a lot of things are happening here at Tennessee Stands. We are very, very hard at work. Trust me when I say we are not backing down. We are still pursuing um, everything happening with our lawsuits, working with schools and all the things that you're seeing us do um, on a weekly basis. But we've made a new hire at Tennessee Stands that I'm really, really excited about. Uh, his name is Russell Newman, and I'll bring Russell on here. And Russell is our new senior litigator at Tennessee Stands. So, Russell, welcome to Tennessee Stands. I want people to get to know you a little bit. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we'll get into uh, some of the case updates in a minute. Um, but just tell people who you are, where you came from, and why you chose to join the fight here at Tennessee Stands. Sure, so like you mentioned, my name is Russell Newman. I'm from Georgia, the Atlanta area. I actually grew up in Fulton County, which is now in the limelight nationwide with the election fraud. So back in 2010-ish, uh, right. we recognized that Fulton County was going downhill. So uh, before I went to law school, we had identified Williamson County as a good place to go. It's conservative, Christian, booming economy. It's got it going on. So I went to law school. Uh, then moved here to Nashville and took the Tennessee bar. And I've been practicing here in Williamson County, uh, Tennessee area, but we picked out Williamson County cause a fantastic place to live. So that's how we ended up here. And I, I see, I see you got the high and tight going a little bit. Tell, tell, tell us about this. There's more, there's more about the haircut than just the haircut, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, in 2003, uh, I was 17, and so I was emancipated by my parents, and I joined the United States Marine Corps. Uh, and so when my stu my fellow uh, high school classmates were packing their bags going on their senior trips, I was packing my bags going to Paris Island. So in 2004, I went into the Marine Corps. I was a hydraulics and airframe structural mechanic on F-18s. The Blue Angels are the airplanes that I worked on. So over the summer, I was at Paris Island, did combat training in Camp Geiger, did aviation school in Pensacola, and then a second aviation school in Oceana, which is Virginia Beach. And then I checked into my uh, squadron, which is at Naval Air Station Atlanta, and they laughed at me because uh, in two weeks we were deploying to Iraq and I had been getting newsletters and, you know, they're going to Key West and Hawaii testing weapon systems. And I had no idea that they were leaving. so. Uh, they laughed at me and said, don't unpack your stuff because you're going with us. So in 2005, I deployed to Al-Assad Air Base in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, turning wrenches on fighter jets, keeping our infantry safe. So deployed in 2005, came back, went to college. I did a, a, a bachelor's in business management. I have a master's degree in theology from Liberty and then went to law school. And at law school, I did a master's of business administration and then the Juris Doctor. And I actually met my wife in, in law school and she ended up moving to Tennessee with me. We did a JD MBA uh, together and I'm actually sponsoring her to the Tennessee Bar. So I'm really excited she's about to become a lawyer. That's fantastic. And you know, why, why would Tennessee Stands not hire a Marine uh, to be our senior litigator? It's kind of, kind of fits the mold of uh of what we do so we're excited to have you on board man well thank you so and and one of the ways that we met we actually didn't know each other at the time but uh you you also filed a lawsuit against governor bill lee which i thought hmm i'd like to know this guy so tell us tell us a little bit about a little bit about that right so I filed a 48 page lawsuit against governor bill lee and mayor rogers anderson who's a mayor of Williamson County. And the lawsuit is a complaint for declaratory judgment. What that means is I'm asking the court to tell me what my rights are. What can the government do to me or order me to do during this uh, state of emergency? And so some of the issues that I am bringing up in my lawsuit uh, is whether the governor has the authority to suspend our constitutional rights, the federal constitutional rights that are given to us uh, during a pandemic, whether the governor has the authority to suspend their state constitutional rights during a pandemic or a state of emergency. Another issue is whether pursuant to the emergency powers, the governor has the ability to suspend your rights. Uh, 
So I contend that the governor does not. And so the, the lawsuit is asking the court to rule on the merits, whether the governor has these authorities. I'm also challenging or I'm claiming that the governor has no authority to infringe on our constitutional right to peaceably assemble. We have a constitutional right, both in the federal and state constitutions to peaceably assemble. And I don't believe that the governor has the authority to ban social gatherings of more than 10 people. I'm challenging whether the governor has the authority to infringe on our constitutional right to travel. We have a right to travel. And I don't think that the governor can infringe upon that federal constitutional right. I'm also challenging whether the governor can infringe on our right to engage in interstate commerce. Can the, can the governor declare some businesses essential, non-essential, shut them down? I don't think he can. So I'm asking for the court to rule. I'm also asking for the court uh, to declare whether the government has the authority to infringe upon our religious beliefs, say for the mask issue. I don't believe that uh, they can mandate you wear a mask. I think that you can claim a religious exemption, at one of many, and you don't have to wear it. So we're challenging that uh, for the mayor specifically. So, so I want to ask you a quick question. I'm going to I'm just going to take I'm going to take a guess. I'm going to take a wild guess here. Um, you filed that lawsuit and then the state subsequently filed a motion to dismiss your case based on you not having standing. I'm just Bingo. I'm just <laughs> Wow. I can't, I can't believe they did that. Who would have saw, seen it coming? So I tried to preempt some of that in the prefatory language in my lawsuit. So they have filed a motion to dismiss. They're challenging on standing, mootness. And so I've tried to plead in there to try to circumvent it uh, that I do have standing and that the case isn't moot. And that if it is moot, we have an exception to mootness, which is capable of repetition yet evading review. Okay, so I want I want to talk about that issue of standing. I I, I did a video a um, week or two ago because, as you well know, obviously, um, our case that we filed on August twenty seventh, twenty twenty, against Governor Bill Lee in Davidson County has now been dismissed. They they the, the judge granted the state's uh, request for dismissal uh, based on standing, and so we're now filing an appeal. Um, you are actually now filing, going to be filing that appeal for us, and um, and one one of the arguments that we're making now is that we, you know, ashamedly, I didn't find this before, but but now we have, and there's a statute in in Tennessee Code annotated one three one twenty one that that seems to say, uh, which by the way, the statute was passed in two thousand eighteen, which which seems to say that. A citizen of this state has standing to ask the question, is my government acting lawfully or constitutionally? We we have a and and that and that the statute has granted a citizen standing to simply ask that question. Um now you found we started talking about that, and you found a case from 2018 um where a appellate court judge had said that that statute really doesn't change anything and the way it's worded um, that a citizen still requires standing. Can you, just, can you just talk about that for a minute and then we'll I'll pull up this letter here in just a second. Sure, so the court found that you still have to have a distinct and palpable injury in order to have standing to bring the lawsuit. Uh, in my lawsuit, I contend uh, that I have a federal right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. I have a state constitutional right. And then the statute that we're talking about, and I'll just read it real quick. It says, notwithstanding any law to the contrary, a cause of action shall exist under this chapter for any affected person. Any affected person so, who seeks... So, so keep, keep going, but we're going to come back to that in a minute. For any affected person who seeks declaratory or injunctive relief in any action brought regarding the legality or constitutionality of a governmental action. A cause of action shall not exist under this chapter to seek damages, damages money. Yeah. Right. So you have a right by this statute, which I thought the, the state and federal constitution uh, was clear. The, the state 
Constitution is clear, and this makes it even clearer because this is the General Assembly passing a bill and the governor signing it saying that if you're affected by governmental action, you can seek declaratory or, in, or injunctive relief. Declaratory judgment, what are my rights? What can the government do to me? Injunctive relief, that is uh, an injunction which forever forbids the government from doing that again. So in my lawsuit, I'm seeking a permanent injunction saying if this is a constitutional violation, you don't do it again. So let's talk real quick about the phrase affected person in the statute, because that, that was one of the phrases that the appellate court used to say that the statute still required a citizen to have an injury, a palpable injury or standing because because of the word affected person. But it it was as you saw, I pulled the video from the House floor from when the bill was presented and they made it clear that their intention of the term affected person was any taxpayer under the jurisdiction of the state affected by the laws being made. That if you're a citizen and a taxpayer and a, an unconstitutional law is made, you're an affected person. But that's not the way. Am I right? And is that the court didn't see it that way? That's correct. And so yeah. we drilled down deeper and found the legislative intent. And Representative Glenn Casada uh, is pretty much saying that is the purpose of this statute is to give or to provide standing as if it weren't clear. He was saying that we already have it, but we're making it even more clear. Yeah. So, so I'm glad you mentioned Representative Cassada because it just so happens that I, I have a letter here from <laughs> Representative Glenn Cassada. So Whenever all this went down, um, I called Representative Cassida and asked him, sir, here's what the court is saying. Was it in fact your intention whenever you ran the bill in the House and presented the bill for passage, did you intend to give citizens standing? He said, well, yes, I did. I said, well, the court doesn't see it that way. So here I want to read this, this statement on page two of his letter here right at the top. And really, you need you need nothing more than this one statement. So and, and then I'll have you talk about legislative intent, which certainly I think this is coming directly from the, the horse's mouth, so to speak. So Representative Cassida says this. So I would like to state for the record that the legislative intent of this law is to secure the right of every citizen or affected person by way of being a taxpayer under the jurisdiction of the laws of the state of Tennessee to question the legality or the constitutionality of a governmental of governmental actions by declaratory action or injunctive relief in the courts. As such, the legislature has granted all citizens of the state standing to bring these actions against the government. Now, now I'm, I'm going to really love to see the judge's reaction to this statement. What, what do you what do you suppose that might be and how how should the judge look at this letter in terms of interpreting the law in terms of trying to find legislative intent so it puts the courts in an interesting position because there is a court of appeals case that pretty much says it doesn't change standing but when we look at the the legislative intent it says that it is providing standing. And so for the legislative intent, let me just read this real quick. This is Representative Glenn Casada in the General Assembly. They're taking questions about the statute as to the purpose and to the intent. And so Glenn says, this is giving the right of the citizen to take government to court if they violate our state law or our constitutional rights. It makes it very clear and cold that we have that right. Then the Representative John Ray Clemens, he's he's asking questions about the breadth. He's concerned about the breadth of yeah, this. What, what, what is this law going to affect? And so he uh, answers it, says that it's going to affect declaratory judgment actions. And he says, or injunctive relief. And he says, yes, injunctive. And he says, across the board. And the answer from Glenn is that is the intent. We have a constitutional right to take our complaints to court on a government that doesn't comply with state law. So what they're doing is they're providing it as if the constitution wasn't clear. Enough. What wasn't enough to provide it? <laughs> this statute is making it abundantly clear. And what's, what's crazy is 
it wasn't clear enough. So now we're drilling down to the legislative intent. And I don't think you can get much clearer than this. That is the intent. We have a constitutional right to take our complaints to court on a government that doesn't comply with state law. So I want I want to it's important we drill down on this for a minute because you you so you they passed the law to make it clear that law was adjudicated in court and the court said it wasn't clear. So now we've gone back to the legislator who ran the bill and he's re-clarifying that no you're wrong, you're misinterpreting the law. This is the legislative intent. So what what now if the if it just so happens that the court still rejects the premise because one of the issues that we're facing right now is there there's a there's a interesting belief seemingly amongst a lot of people because of various Supreme Court rulings that courts make laws. I, I have heard so many people say they'll, they'll, they'll reference a Supreme Court ruling and they'll call it the law of the land. I'm like, well, no, not necessarily. It, it was a ruling between two parties involving a case in controversy, but but courts don't make laws. But But here what we're seeing is not only do courts not make laws, but the court here has simply taken the law and this determined to, to recreate the law and make the law say what it wants the law to say. And now there's an argument between the legislature who makes laws and the court who has to adjudicate by the law. And there's an argument between the two branches as to what the law means. Who should win? I guess what I'm asking you is, and why, talk, speak to that. Who should win that argument but as to what the law means? The legislature or the judicial branch? The legislature. I mean, they're the one that passed the law. They're the one that had the hearings. They're the one who was asked the purpose behind the law. So the, the court is supposed to carry out the will of the legislature, and this makes it abundantly clear. Now, I will say that courts can only decide that which is presented before. It. So I think the best case outcome is to present this to the legend or to the to the courts and say, look, this is the intent of the law. It is designed to give standing and they have the ability to do that. So now that this is before you and you're aware of it, we're going to ask that you issue a ruling that's consistent with the General Assembly's intent. And the General Assembly is representation of what the people want. And and I, as I'm thinking about this, you know, in terms of what we're able to get out of this lawsuit, number one, obviously, thank you to Representative Cassida and the General Assembly as a whole for passing this law. That was certainly step one into clarifying the rights of individual of the individual to petition the government. But if we're actually able to get get this ruling in court and actually set the court precedent that, yeah, this is in fact what the law means and citizens have a right to take their government to court, that's going to, would, would you imagine that that's going to change a lot here in Tennessee in terms of our rights being secured to petition the government? Absolutely. I mean, if, if we look at what's going on now, I don't, by the, the state's argument, I don't even have the right to know what my rights are that because right. of the standing yeah. issue. I mean, that's right, outrageous. Right. I mean, if, if I'm affected by government action, if I'm locked in my house, if I can't go to the store, if I can't, if I can't gather with people because there's more than 10 people involved and, and I want to ask or petition the government for a redress of grievances, which is a right, how am I supposed to do that if, if I can never have standing? So, th th I mean, that's the point is to give people standing. And it also keeps government in check. If they can take you to court and, and you know, file a lawsuit against you and they have standing, that keeps the, the government in check. Right. Yeah. Which is, which is I think, precise. It, you know, you have checks and balances with, within the branches of government. This is the ability for the people to bring a, to bring a check as part of those checks and balances. It's a great system as long as we don't ignore it, which which we currently are. Um, final thing I'll say about standing, which I thought was interesting, you know, in the in the uh, Judge uh, Chancellor Moscow from Davidson County, when she wrote her opinion when she dismissed our case against the governor, you know, she literally, in, in defining the fact that we lack standing, one of, the, one of the reasons we lack standing, and I found this so interesting, is be, is, not only because we didn't have a direct and palpable injury 
but because the injury affected everyone equally. And so because it affected everyone equally and did not affect me distinctly that I didn't have standing. So can we just think about that for a moment? If if that if that's how we're going to roll in the court, within well, what law could you challenge in court? Because all state law is going to affect the population equally. It's a state law. So then I guess they can make all the unconstitutional laws they want and you can never challenge them in court because it affects everyone. That's am I am I off? It's a ridiculous argument. Oh, uh, you're on point. I mean, there's not much more to say, but that was literally what what she said. Uh Russell, we're running out of time. I we're we're gonna have you on again because um we may we may dig a little bit deeper into some of the other issues that that are in our case and yours dealing with emergency powers because as you all well know the legislature still has not dealt with that issue mm -hmm. so it's it's still left in the courts right now to deal with um, this egregious overreach we experienced in terms of emergency powers but I want to have you back to talk about um, our case against Williamson County Schools which you are now representing new plaintiffs that have intervened in that case, which we certainly hope and believe have standing uh, to challenge the the mandates that we were seeing in the schools. Um, I, why, don't, why don't you why don't you intro that a little bit to close? Sure. So uh, Raina sent her son to school not wearing a mask after this uh, order came down, which it was an alternative order saying dismissing the case for <clears throat> lack of standing. But then saying if there is standing, we find that, you know, the, the school board doesn't have the authority to mandate a mask. So Raina sends her child to school and he has the copy of the order and says that I'm not required to wear a mask. You don't have the authority to do it. Send him with a letter and then uh, he gets sent to the principal's office. And so she gets a phone call saying that he has to put a mask on or he gets ejected, thrown out of school. And so in Tennessee, our children have a constitutional right to go to school. I mean, that that is a right. And so uh, he's well, saying, well, constitutionally, uh, Article 16, Section 12, the General Assembly is giving a constitutional mandate to provide for the free and public education of children in the state. That's absolutely right. And we put that in the lawsuit as well. So he has a right to be there. I mean, it's not something that we're making up. It's in the Constitution. And so he's told you're either going to put on a mask or we're going to throw you out. And so he says, well, I'm not putting on a mask and they throw him out. So that's standing. That that's a distinct right. and palpable injury. He got thrown out of school and he was forbidden from being there, even though he had a right to be there. So we're trying to intervene in the case. The case uh, was pending. And after a final order is entered, there's 30 days between uh, the time that it's entered and that you can file a motion to alter or amend. And what you're asking the court to do is to alter or amend the judgment. What we're asking the court to do is to let us intervene as plaintiffs with standing and pretty much reset, redo it, because the whole purpose of the law is to adjudicate the case on the merits and have justice, have now, a final now, resolution. Now, wait a minute. Before we close, I want to ask you one more question. So you you filed the motion to intervene. Correct. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a wild guess here. The <laughs> The defendants filed a motion to dismiss based on standing bingo <laughs> <laughs> i think we've stumbled on a pattern we've seen, we've we figured out the opponent's strategy in terms of us not being heard in court yeah yeah and, and they're saying that we're not a party it's untimely it cites no authority we don't have a right uh it's already been dismissed the order is final what's your, final kid, order? your kid got thrown out of school but you have no right to challenge the law that's what this Un, undeserving of of being in court. It's it's outrageous, <laughs> but oh oh moot. That's another one. Moot. moot. No longer a mask mandate, so you can never find out what your rights are. Yeah, well, the reason it's not moot, of course, which I which we need to argue is the fact that they're they're gonna do this again next year. The 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 new one is gonna be if you're unvaccinated, you have to wear a mask. That's gonna be the new one. Um, which which is is my concern, obviously. Well. Russell, um, I'm so glad folks got to meet you today. Um, I look forward to them getting to know you more and um, and working with you. I think it's going to be 
a lot of fun. Um, thanks for joining us. And hey, thank you for watching us here at Tennessee Stands. If you haven't yet, uh, please make sure to go to TennesseeStands.org and hit the subscribe button, sign up for our emails. That's that's really critical as we uh, continue to keep you informed, especially as we get back into legislative session. And next year, y'all, is 2022. It's elections. So you're going to want to stay engaged um, with us as we walk through that together. All right. Thanks for joining. See you next time.